good afternoon friends and very good morning from my place where i'm addressing i extend a very warm and hearty welcome to all the participant and the learned speaker to the 83rd webinar on fifth q and a session on companies and securities law this program we are organizing as our knowledge initiative by corporate professional now onwards we have decided we will organize one webinar on each fr a first friday of every month on recent regulatory updates like last one month in company law and securities law so from this type uh, the every month on first friday we will do whatever amendment whatever changes whatever the legal cases whatever other issues relating to corporate company law and security law so the first wednesday was first friday of every month friends so participant can send their questions in advance and they can raise their query relating to recent regulatory updates in advance so we can discuss and answer in first friday webinar of next month in this line we have organized this webinar to answer the queries to the following key areas number 1 independent director then related party then corporate social responsibility including form csr2 recent amendment in llp act insider trading and takeover regulation these are the these are the issues where we have seen various changes proposed by the government and they have implemented also now so this is uh, corporate india has to face and there must be some questions some issues they must be facing so we want to solve all their problem we have a galaxy of expert who will answer each queries of you mr amit gupta mr ankit singhi mr gp madan mr manoj kumar mohini bashne and narayan shankar नितेश लटवाल रुचिका शर्मा एस सुधाकर एस सी सेतिया जी ना फ्रेंड्स बिकॉज दिस प्रोग्राम वी डोंट वेस्ट एनी टाइम फॉर इंट्रोडक्शन इन ऑल दीज पीपल आर नोन टू यू एंड दे हैव कंटिन्यूसली अटेंडेड एंड गिविंग द आंसर ऑफ वेरियस ऑफ योर क्वेरीज इन सो मेनी वेबिनार्स सो आई एम नॉट डिवोटिंग एनी टाइम फॉर दिस आई एम नॉट इन इन इंडिया आई एम एड्रेसिंग दिस वेबिनार फ्रॉम डबलिन Uh, so there may be something we we be miss so i hope uh, that you will not mind friends as you are aware that our knowledge initiative process is going on and this is our 83rd webinar and we have not stopped single webinar till today except few holidays which, which have come on the day of friday uh, the purpose of this that whatever issues are going on and um we can you can raise and these are the expert who are handling these queries day and night they will answer to your queries so friends without devoting any time for anything i am starting directly uh, questions and my sequence will be like this i will ask questions relating to independent director then rpt then csr then llp then insider trading and then take over law and what uh, we have divided topics amongst the all the speakers so independent director uh, we will start uh, with ankit singhi gp madan uh, nishtesh tatwal as sudhakar and setia ji so my uh, the questions will come on your display, screen and accordingly i will take the name of the person who will give answer and other person if there is any addition point then you add because we have 81 questions so we have to answer all the questions so that's why we want to focus on solving queries of each and everybody so i am starting with this so ankit singhi um, uh, nitesh sudhakar and setia ji be ready okay these question i will address uh, after id i will ask question on rpt then csr then llp and then Uh, insider trading and take over law so this you can will uh, and in the meantime if you have any question please write to us we will uh, take up and in the last any other query other than these topics you can send it we will talk we will ask at the last 
so i am starting with independent director so first question is on independent director is because now independent director questions are lots of confusion are there so regulation 161 b 4 uh, restricts a person having material pecuniary relation ship with the listed entity its holding subsidiary associate company or other promoters or directors during the three preceding preceding financial year or during the current financial year from being appointed as id what is the meaning of material pecuniary relationship sudhakar sudhakar you shall, have to shall i give one shall i give sudhakar ji you are on mute yes yeah, sorry sir at the outset my sincere thanks to corporate professionals for giving me i think this is my eighth or ninth webinar which i am doing out of the 83 webinars and uh, corporate professionals is the only one who is on a consistent basis and a continuous basis organizing these webinars and spreading the wisdom to all the professionals my hearty congratulations to pavan and the entire your team of corporate professionals coming back to the question of material pecuniary relationship as such this is not defined neither under the companies act nor under the listing regulations so pecuniary relationship we all know that it is something concerned with the to a large extent monetary benefits maybe directly or indirectly so what is a material pecuniary relationship means to my knowledge what i can say is any kind of relationship material means that is going to influence the other person to start dancing to the tunes of the person who has been appointed that means an independent director should not have any kind of material pecuniary relationship means he should not get influenced by the persons who have appointed him by having a kind of material pecuniary relationship whether it is with the holding company or subsidiary company or associate companies or with the promoters directors and so on and so forth that is what material pecuniary relationship means. okay uh, nitesh you want to say anything so material pecu- uh, in, under the companies act uh, there is a pecuniary relationship but under the uh, listing regulation there is a world add to that pecuniary relationship so pecuniary relationship means uh, material pecuniary means it must be material in the nature for example let's suppose a retired banker has joined uh, some good uh, some good uh, company as a independent director and, and he earns for all its income from that uh, ent- entire income from that listed entity then from that angle he is a it's a, a material pecuniary because material pecuniary has to be seen from from the from from the independent director itself rather than a from the point of view of the company so it has to be uh, uh, for example it's uh, just i said uh, a retired person so for example another person has joined as an independent director and earning commission but that commission is not material to his income so that will not be treated as a material pecuniary relation any sethya ji and ankit and you want to add anything i think one small point sir i think companies act apart from prescribing a pecuniary relationship also prescribes a limit as to the transactions if they are beyond that limit it will be treated as pecuniary transaction so generally for sebi or for ludr regulations also because since there no limit is given it just uses the word material uh, pecuniary transaction so we at times refer to the same exact limits that are given under the companies act which are missing in the ludr and that can also give you a good indication as to whether that will be material or not okay setya ji you have to add anything you have to unmute yourself sir सेतिया जी आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही हाँ अब आ रही है हाँ सर कैरियर दैट लिमिट हैज टू बी वी हैव टू डिपेंड ऑन द कंपनी टू कंपनी व्हाट इज द कंपनी बिजनेस इफ स्मॉल कंपनी दिस लिमिट विल बी स्मॉल एंड इफ इट इज अ बिगर कंपनी इट विल बी अ बिगर लिमिट्स ओके ओके सो आई सुधाकर आई रिकॉल ए वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग डिस्कशन विच वी हैड with our colleague uh, pk he was referring one case of uh, um, uh, infosys long back and i think uh, we must understand and that is the best part to understand what is materially pecuniary relationship what happened some of the independent because in you remember infosys is giving commission so all the directors were getting commissions so one independent director told to the chairman that why can't you pay the 
our commission monthly or quarterly so chairman thought it is illegal so there is no issue so he said yes we can do so he called the company secretary and that company secretary was our uh, nothing uh, but uh, parvati sam uh, pk we call so he told no no sir we can't do this so they ask what is the problem well i'll tell you in the board room and in the board room he discussed this issue and very interesting point has come out he told sir independent comes with the depending material relationship now what is happening if we pay them the quarterly or monthly it means their earning survival is through this company so he told that we if this is the survival through the company's commission it means his independent is not there so here it's not a amount here is not a uh, person's uh, own wealth but this is another between the line also which all the four speaker has said that you have to see in over reality overall issue is that if your dependence is on this basis it means something you will compromise and i think entire board has appreciated and they have not given commission to them that's Man. why i said that when you talk about material pecuniary relationship means if it is influencing the other person yes that's right the matter so that should he should not because the moment he got influenced his independence is getting compromised yeah so friends this is uh, uh, so this is very important question in all questions when there is a test you have to test whether something is um, hitting his independence or not if something is dependent then his independence will compromise next question so what is the maximum permitted indebtedness in regulation 161b uh, of 5 Uh, that will not make a person ineligible from being appointed as id whatever these limits are individual or aggregate or all uh, relatives anke okay. nitesh you can give his voice uh, his uh, nitesh yeah so the the limit actually not prescribed under lodr but it is prescribed under companies that it is 50 lakh limit or so it has to be seen collectively for all the individuals any different view of sudhakar and uh, setya ji he is right yeah, that the limit is the 50 lakhs but it needs to be enhanced okay limit is so, very small okay so whatever uh, the speakers are saying and the we are receiving questions we will uh, if there is a non clarity or confusion we will refer it to the government also for for the clarification yeah next question can the board of director appoint an independent director for the second term as an additional director designated as an independent director subject to approval of shareholders so that uh, this particular question you know if i am not wrong i have answered in the last webinar of corporate professional also and this has been very extensively discussed and the rational for my answer which i am going to give also is explained in the Provide the guidance for the independent directors. See what it says is 149 subsection 10 very clearly says that the independent director shall be eligible for reappointment for the second term on passing a special resolution by the company. That means his eligibility for the second term comes only after the special resolution is passed. That means it should be a prior approval of the shareholders. What is required? Number one, as far as the first term is concerned, board is well within its powers to appoint him, and all the companies they appoint him as an additional director, designated as an independent director for a term of five years. As far as the second term is concerned, one forty nine ten very clearly says that he is eligible only on passing a special resolution by the company. That's why for second term, board has no power to appoint him; it is only with the shareholders. Another question comes: Whether the approval is to be taken before his first term expires? Answer is yes, because one forty nine eleven very clearly says that the independent director can hold office for a consecutive two terms. Consecutive means one after the other; there should not be a break in between. That's why before his first term gets expired, 
the company has to approve his appointment for the second term by way of a special resolution. And okay. suppose if it has not been taken, what is the what are the consequences? Say, for example, for whatever the reasons it is before the first term expires, he has not been appointed, then he cannot be appointed for a second term thereafter. Once first term he expires, he cannot be appointed there. That's what matters. Okay. Uh, I think uh, this is okay. Uh, this next, is okay. Uh, yeah, next question. Is it necessary to appoint the independent director for second can term? I add, can I add one more thing also? And yeah. that I remember now. See, there is another angle also in the recently in one of the forums I have been asked this question. Say, for example, the first term expired, and before his first term expired, the company has not appointed the independent director for the second term. There is a break. So, for example, after three months, can he be appointed again as an independent director for a period of five years, counting it as a first term? The answer to that also is he cannot be appointed because he has to have the cooling period of three years, then only he can be appointed, yeah. otherwise not. That is okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next question. Uh, is it necessary to appoint the independent director for second term before the first term expires, or he can be appointed even after the first term expires? I think sir, Sudhakar exactly sir has answer. already replied. Sudhakar has question. already covered. Okay, next. Can an independent director be appointed as an executive director immediately after the tenure of two terms are completed? How about his appointment as non-executive director, Ankit? Non-executive director, he can continue. There is no bar uh, on continuation as non-executive director. So that no, sir, the there the question is executive director. Sir, from the yeah yeah with effect from this, I think uh, I yeah think from the April term, uh, with effect from this first of January, January they have barred this appointment. They had barred this, but in case of resignation, but. Wherever a person or independent director completes his tenure, there is no such bar as such. Uh, okay. Robert, I would like to add one or two things more here. If you see the regulation 25 sub regulation 11, what it says is no independent director who resigns from the listed entity mm. shall be appointed as an executive or whole time director on the board unless until the cooling period of one year is there. That means only when the independent director resigns before expiration of his term, then only he will be disqualified. Suppose if an independent director complete his two terms, can he be appointed? The answer seems to be yes, because yes. they have used the word who resigns. Then but the Sudhakar, what, is the, what is the difference? What is the difference? If I resign, if I completed, if yeah, you... I will, you the, I will tell you the difference. Say, for example, I have been appointed on corporate professionals as an independent director for two terms of five years each and I have completed my 10 years period. After completion of my term, can I be appointed as an executive director? Answer is yes. Suppose on the eighth year I have resigned. Immediately after my resignation, can you appoint me as an executive director? Answer is no, provided corporate no. professionals is a listed company. I am talking about. Just to give an example. So there I am resigning. So I cannot be appointed as an executive director unless until there is a cooling period of one year. Similarly, now can I be, suppose if I resign, can I continue number one as a non-executive director? Answer as I think Ankit has already said that, yes, you can continue to be as a non-executive director, non-independent, there is no issue at all. But Sudhakar, why, what is the logic behind this? I will tell you the logic. Sometimes it may so happen. I am an independent director, but it so happens, say for example, I have been disqualified to be an independent because whatever the uh, the what's called as you know the parameters are there. One parameter may got affected because of that. I cannot continue as an independent director. But in all probability, as far as I am concerned, I am ready to. I mean, I am uh, a good. Uh, this thing to the board, a good addition to the board, so I can continue as a non-independent director. Question comes, why SEBI has brought this amendment? He should not be appointed as an executive director. Because the moment he comes to know that he can be appointed as an executive director, he will compromise again with his independence. 
That is the reason actually SEBI says that when a person resigns, he should not be appointed unless until there is a cooling period of one year. Ankit, do you have some other other experience on this? No, I think this I, this is the only reason. I just to stop a quid pro. I help you, you help me in becoming an old time director. So I think just just I don't know whether the gap will serve any purpose or not. But uh, yes, that's the only reason. Okay, okay. Next question. In case an independent director who was appointed for the first term could not clear the proficiency test within the prescribed time, what are the consequences? Nitesh. Sir, if we go by the strict interpretation, then he cannot continue as a independent director. Then he ceases to be. He will. He will be. He will be non-executive, non-independent director. Then. Uh, till, the you... time it, till the time it uh, registers. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Arunda, the currently time. there is another challenge, sir. If you are not able to qualify the test, the system is not allowing you to again re-roll yourself. So you your term your term is expired. Yeah. You're not able to take the test. You cannot apply for re-registration on the database. So that is also a training point. As soon as you are out of the registration from the database, your eligibility automatically is moved out. So what is the process? How to? Uh, I think that this we this we have already flagged to IACA. It's being with the policy cell with ministry. I think they are looking into it. as to if there are for genuine reasons a director is not able to uh, give that exam and on account of reasons relating to covid a lot uh, the reasons so whether they should be allowed to take one more or a uh, couple of more of attempts uh, during a particular uh, extended period how is that according to me as far as this qualification of the proficiency test is concerned keep it aside the moment within the given time if he could not qualify the proficiency test and he is not exempted from the proficiency test this independency independent directorship ceases to exist that means he has to he cannot be an independent director from the day of the last day where he is supposed to be qualified the question comes can he be appointed once he qualifies again answer is again the same thing he cannot be appointed unless until there is a three year cooling period has to come because it is neither it is not a second term so it is not a consecutive term also so he cannot be appointed there so that's why one has to be very very careful The moment you appoint as an independent director, ensure that within the given time you qualify the proficiency test. Okay, Ankit, uh, I'm just asking as a layman. What is the today's situation? If I want to be independent director, I have to qualify this test first. No, I think once you are appointed, uh, you uh, take the enrollment. I think there are two years within which you have to uh, get the uh, clear the test. without registration with the iaci you cannot be appointed okay so my, my if i if i am if i am a first time joining some board i have to register and yes. then within two years i have to qualify okay second yeah. situation i am on the i am i am on the board of a company and within two years i have to do this also i am already appointed i think that yeah. sir that timeline is already been um, uh, i think it passed uh, there are certain extensions that were given that timeline has already gone Okay, so if I am not qualified and I am on the board, should I? It means I have to resign. If you have not qualified within the nine period, you need to resign. Office automatically vacates. Independent director. Automatically vacates, sir. Designation का तो बात ही नहीं बनती. No, no. Uh, no not is... vacation, sir. It uh, yeah, he cannot act as an independent. Ah, so I am talking about the independent sense only. So it means that if I am not qualified during the period which has prescribed, my independent directorship go. I will be called as a non-independent director. Is it right, Sudhakar? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So how many people are uh, uh, now uh, coming into this uh, category? All the people have passed their exam, or something is uh, left out, or what is the exemption? The, the I think most of them, most of the people. Yeah, exemption rules have been liberalized so much. Only as you want to have as a director or KMP ten years of experience, whereas now it is hardly three years. Only as they have used the word you have to be a director of a company. Now it is a body corporate also. Only it was not there. Body corporate word was not there. Now they brought so it. So banks are out. Suddenly, yeah, there are several government secretary level people. All those things have been given. So to a large extent, it is already diluted. So Sudhakar, I am the I am the director in some companies, and I had a director. Now I want to join. Should I appear? Should I qualify the test, or my, I will be an exemption? 
you have three years of experience as a director, you don't need to qualify that test. Okay. Okay. Next. Uh, you know, let me also add here. If anybody wants to check that whether he is qualified or he is exempted, if you go to the IACA site, they, it will come there itself. You are exempted from the test. The moment okay. you put your uh, whatever your exam and uh, these things are there, okay. eligibility parameters. Okay. Uh, a, a got Mr. A got registered with IACA database and appointed as ID on first January 2020 and renewed the. Uh, on 1st January 2021, again renewed by 1st January 22. He shall complete three years as ID on 31st 12, 2022. Can he claim exemption from proficiency test, Nitesh? So, uh, so the proficiency, proficiency test has to be seen uh, at the time of uh, once you once you registered with the IICA. So later on, if you got that experience, then it will not be uh, it will not give you the exemption. Okay. Okay. Now a few questions I have received from the public on independent director. I'm asking, uh, so Dakar, there's a very interesting point. Can legal firm where independent director is partner provide legal services to the company? That, uh, for the material pecuniary relationship, there is an exemption is there under the company side that, uh, 2% of that billing has to not go to them under the, to the form. I mean, if it is within that limit, then there is no issue as such. Otherwise, it will be a problem. But Sudhakar, this is the one question which I'm always asking. How can you make uh, somebody uh, uh, independent if whatever relationship he has, so 2%, 5%, 10%, whatever you are doing, whatever I'm getting from some company, it means my, relation, my independence will be compromised. Is it not? Uh, I think, between? sir, the question relates to what Sudhakar said, uh, sir, said earlier, whether that payment is sufficient enough to uh, jeopardize your independence. Because if you see law firms, they are billing in such huge amount. And if a company is billing a, a very small percentage, in totality, if you see, while optically it may look that it may influence, but in totality, if you do in terms of revenue, it might not have such uh, good effect. Okay, on that I'm person. asking another Sudhakar. I'm asking another question in different way. I'm the lawyer, and I'm on the board of say ten companies, and every company is giving me the commission. Oh, sorry, this uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm professional legal fees, fees another thing. And that is coming in the limit, but cumulatively that amount is a sufficient amount. So I, I this limit has to seen individually, or this limit has to seen collectively. The company to company it is not collectively. Number one, number two, what is the reason for this thing? Why that limit has been provided? Say for example, Mr. Harish Salve is a director, independent director on my board, and suppose tomorrow there is one case, I want his services. If you completely say that you cannot have any kind of relationship with him, it means virtually you are depriving the company from his services. So that's why it is a correct way the legislature has given that some kind of a leeway, very uh, the 2% of his earnings, not the company's total turnover, the 2% of his earnings. That is a very small amount. If he gets, there is no issue. He's not get, going to get his independence compromised. Okay. That is what the. Okay. Okay, another Not question easy. is, uh, which I'm asking uh, uh, Setia ji, how to ensure transparency in appointment of ID? Now promoters appoints person known or positively inclined to the company and person who are not familiar, though they may be highly qualified and deserving, may get ignored. This jeopardize independence of an independent director. Your comments. Basically in India, it is uh, the business is a, pro, a, a promoter driven. So promoters appoints independent director of their friends, etc. But the independence come from the state of mind. Whether person is a clear in mind, I am an independent director. I have not to compromise with the promoters. So okay. basically it is a state of mind. Uh, a person has uh, while appointing as an independent director. 
suppose i am independent director on your company if your friendship uh, uh, we may be friends but there may be not be any re relationship between us on the directors in independence i will speak loudly that this is not corporate governance is not met this strategy is not met this things is not but basically clearly it's a state of mind if you see any committee report whether it is a cadbury committee section committee or other narendra chandra committee everybody has stress upon the state of mind okay ankit uh, state of mind has uh, any link with the independence i think it 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 may have a role but can you define sadakar state of mind if you if you allow me you very difficult yeah when company said 2013 has come it has said that the tenure of the independent directors prior to that date will not be counted is question there are several major listed companies are there where on the boards of those companies the direct independent directors are there for over 15 20 years even in my okay. company also there were directors like that so i have been questioned at several forums don't you think that the directors who are there for ages their independence gets compromised my answer to that is like this not necessarily a person's familiarity with the company or the seniority with the company he is going to compromise his independence in fact a person who is there with the company for the last 15 20 years he know the culture of the organization he know the values of the organization he know the family very well and he can tell them whatever he says the family respects the family means the promoter respects it and that gentleman need not hesitate to call his spade a spade for example a person who has been appointed say one year before do you think he will be able to act that independently because he got his visiting card only about a year before all the perks and other things he is getting it you mean to say he will be more independent than of a person who is there with the company for over 20 years so as satya ji rightly mentioned it's a perception of the mind independence is a perception of the mind a person with one year he may compromise his independence a person with 20 years also may compromise his independence okay so you cannot just say this thing okay ankit uh, for a section 8 company cpsc under ministry of science as per companies act id is not mandatory but as per dpe guideline id appointment is required how to navigate this matter and which will be the prevailing legislator sir dp guidelines are special uh, law which are applicable to psu so they have to appoint independent directors if the dp guidelines provide so okay okay uh, does non material related party transaction of subs i think this this i will ask uh, uh, later on because it's rpt uh, can the shareholder appoint the res re id with retrospective effect nitesh no sir okay no any different any different view no no i okay. agree with you okay uh, is uh, ankit is a reappointment of md requires approval of shareholder within 3 months as per regulation 171c of sebi lodr regulation sir in my opinion it should not require the approval within 3 months okay any different view i agree with ankit okay Uh, can private company issue unsecured unless uh, this is this later on we will ask uh, somebody has given comment ica the dashboard are not providing helping in selection of id what is the use of passing the test so that can you have any comments that's true there are only enablers they cannot get your job placement portals <laughs> are only enablers <laughs> that doesn't mean you go and get registered and then you get a job there it's not like that okay Okay, Nitesh. Whether CSCS having working experience of more than fifteen years in different executive roles in the company or bank is exempted from passing yes. proficiency test yes, to join IT? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, uh, can a person acting as a nominee director on the board of the listed company after completing of the tenure can be appointed as a ID on the same board? Sir, if he meets the eligibility no. legally, he can be appointed if he meets the eligibility. Okay, okay. 
uh, RBI does not grant NBFC registration even for private limited company without appointing independent director. There is no corresponding law in the, in, as per Companies Act 2013. Sir, there is no such requirement that RBI mandates appointment of independent directors in unlisted I, companies. Uh, I, think, I think I think NBFC, which are uh, systematically uh, important NBFCs, hmm. so they need to comply with the corporate governance norms as prescribed by the NBFC master direction. Uh, so, but not so, at the time of registration. Uh, no, not at the true, time of registration, true. but uh, once you achieve a 500 crore limit of total asset size, so you will be covered under corporate governance. So the answer is even if you are a private company. Even if you have a private company and there is a mandate, then you have to appoint an independent director whether the company yeah. act is silent on this. Okay? Okay. Yes, one thing uh, here that, you know, when this question is coming up time and I think two, three questions have come up on this issue. The first and primary thing is a company has to comply with the company act. Over and above that, if it is subject to any sectoral regulations, it has to comply with sectoral rules also. Similarly, if it is a listed company, it has to comply with the listed, listing regulations. And mm. ultimately, whichever is on the higher pedestal, whatever the regulations which are applicable to you, whichever is on the higher pedestal, you have to comply with. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sudhakar, as per SEBI LODR, recent amendments, regulation 16 for company has taken director liability insurance for independent director. Whether premium paid to insurance companies should be formed part of ID remuneration? No, not at all. No. ID is not getting any remuneration. Okay, it's not a part of the remuneration. They yeah. It's an obligation on the company. You need to comply okay. with this. Uh, Nitesh, how many attempts can be given by ID in a single day? And he's talking about the exam. I don't think so. There is any such restriction of uh, giving any kind, uh, any number of uh, attempts. Okay. Uh, Setya ji, somebody is asking, please uh, guide us which DP guideline being referred for appointment of independent director for section 8 companies dp there may be because this is a separate sectorial thing dp guidelines i'm not aware ki what is dp guidelines for section 8 although there are companies section 8 companies but mostly they are engaged in the business of uh, promoting uh, art culture etc Okay. DP guidelines otherwise fix up the higher number of independent director for uh -huh. the other companies, other uh, undertakings. Okay. Section 8 uh -huh. is not because Section 8 is not a business a model. Okay. So somebody was asking that there is no question flashing. Friends, these are the questions which we have received earlier and these are the online questions I have received and we are asking. Now, I will uh, shift to the related party transaction. So the questions relating to the related party. So friends, uh, I will start. Can institutional investor also become related party? Sudhakar, because you are handling so many institutional mm -hmm. investors. Actually, that, that is from uh, the moment that the institutional investor is having more than 20% after 1st April 22, he will become a related party. And if he is holding more than 10% after April 1st, 23, no doubt about it, because there is no such exemption as such it is given. Okay. And okay. Yeah, that is what uh, my you know, it's a bit uh, silly, uh, but it is law. Okay, friends, I'm asking question to the specific person. If anybody have want to add something, just raise your hand. So I'll ask. Okay. Now, next question, uh, Setya ji. How the beneficial interest will be calculated for the purpose of determining related party? Beneficial interest, because beneficial interest is that the actually share is held by somebody else, who is somebody else is the shareholder, but he is holding the only beneficial interest. So okay. beneficial interest have to, uh, because he is not related party, the holder of the beneficial interest is not the related party. The holder of the share is a related party. My views is that on. Okay. Any sir, different view? Sir, sir, Mr. Setya ji, can we invoke section 90 here just to uh, determine the actual beneficial? No, no, people are invoking. There is no doubt. People are invoking. Okay. So, okay. Rakhi, sir, if, if section 90 also uses the term beneficial interest, while the definition yeah. 
of SBO in the rules uh. I have not used the term beneficial interest, but uh. section ninety per se is for beneficial interest. Ankit, section ninety is entirely different to that of section eighty nine. Hmm. What section eighty nine talks about is the person who is the beneficial owner. He is not the registered owner. That is the difference. But actually, he is the beneficiary, right? So what we hear the listing regulation says is including the beneficial interest means if I am having any kind of shares in a company, but for whatever the reasons it is, it is registered in the name of somebody else, and I have filed that MDT three four that four, four five six that is also to be counted for the purpose of ten percent or twenty percent whatever it is. As far as section ninety is concerned, it's entirely a different ballgame. That is only for the purpose of disclosures. It is significant beneficial ownership. That is nothing to do with as far as the ownership is concerned for the purpose of ten and twenty percent. Okay, okay, okay. So now I have related party transaction. So many questions. So please, uh, I uh, I will be on focusing only on the crux. Since the word use, uh, next question. Since the word use are at any time during the immediate preceding financial year, for what period should be twenty percent or ten percent shareholder be tracked? Ankit, for any period at any point of time, even for a single day. That uh, within during the financial year, financial any year. point of time. It has to be preceding year for the for this year. Ah, uh, preceding financial year. year. Yeah, ah, we need so to. They are saying preceding financial year. Any, any day, any time. Any day at any time in the preceding okay. year. Okay. Next. But here the beauty uh, is that suppose, say, for example, if a person is uh, holding the percentage for even single day financial year twenty one twenty two, he will be a relevant party in the financial year twenty two twenty three, despite the fact he is not holding even a single share in financial year twenty two twenty three. Correct. Sir. Okay. That's clear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, next question is: If shareholder of any person entity hits the threshold of twenty twenty percent, the twenty percent or ten percent say in the month of April, will they be related party only in the next financial year? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Next. Will SPO under Section ninety also? Get covered as the regulation only refers to declaration received under Section eighty nine. Nitesh, sir, it has different interpretation. Uh, just Sudhakar sir said it only covers only eighty nine, not ninety. Sudhakar, you have any view? I, I am absolutely clear as far as I am concerned. Ninety has nothing to do with only eighty nine is concerned with. As far okay. as the percentage is concerned. Okay. Next. In case in case HUF is a promoter, who would be the promoter group? It is treated as an individual. Karta or body corporate group is not. Karta. Karta. Any other point? Okay. Next. Since institutional get uh, would get included, what would be the implication if an institution holding more than twenty by ten percent equity share holding also holds similar or lower equity holding? In some other entity, which may have business connection with the other entity, where is the institution hold more than twenty or ten percent? Thank you. It has to be seen in the context of the company for which we are ascertaining the related party. That okay. Next, so, if you see, if you see the rationale given for by the working group when they have recommended about the RPT amendment, which have come based on that working group recommendation only, they say that not necessarily a person holding ten percent or twenty percent needs to be the promoter to consider as a related party. With that kind of shareholding, we can certainly influence the companies, and they are getting away without falling under the definition of related party. That is the okay. reason why they have brought a person, even if he is not a promoter, but he is holding this ten or twenty person, needs to be considered as a related party, and the compliances are to be met with. On your own mute. Amit uh, Amit Gupta is also joined. Amit, any question where you have a different view? Because your topic assigned is CSR and LLP, but uh, any question which you think you can give a different mm -hmm. dimension, please uh, raise your hand. I will ask. Okay, 
uh, Ankit, is it the obligation of the promoter to report their holding in different companies or is it the responsibility of the listed company? I think uh, listed companies uh, have to uh, check with the promoters as to who are the promoter and promoter group companies. The obligation first is on the listed company and uh, similarly on the promoter companies also. So Dakar, any different view? I mean, so it is the responsibility of the, the secretary of the company. It is, the onus is not on the promoter at all. He declares his uh, uh, shareholding to disclose all those things. It is the company, okay. uh, the, the company secretary who has to see from the ROI because he is the custodian of the ROI. He has to see that. Okay, next. Will amount of corporate guarantee given to the bank by the holding company or a loan availed by the subsidy will be taken into account for material threshold of 10%? Ankit? I think yes, uh, it's amount to transfer of obligation. So in my view, it will be covered. So any other view? Okay. okay. Since it's a very contentious issue uh, because uh, if you see the corporate word, corporate practices, generally the guarantee is not considered as a related party transaction. The industry is divided on this particular point in two parts. Few corporates have considered because if you see the list of related party transactions also, because I'm saying it from the understanding, if you see the shareholders approval under 23.4, where the maturity uh, threshold is crossed, how many companies have gone to take that particular approval? Uh, means uh, if I have done some analysis, we have raised this issue in our close group also. And uh, the industry per se seems to be divided. And uh, though I agree in my personal view, yes, it should be uh, falling in the list of related party transaction, triggering the approval as well, if it is crossing. I, I think if I'm not wrong, as far as the listed company is concerned, and Ankit rightly said, it is falling under the transfer of obligation. So definitely it is getting covered under the related party transaction definition of 2 C. Correct. No, if I'm, Sudhakar, if I'm giving guarantee, uh, uh, bank guarantee and I'm giving something, so it means if there's some problem, it will come on me. So it should be covered. That's why it should be covered. That's what I say. Okay, next. Uh, next question. Is transaction with trust of the company RPT, Nitesh? Yes, sir. If trust uh, covers under related party, it will be. No, no. In fact, we have to see the who are the manager or the holder of the trust, basically. So I think what who that is, is controlling what the trust, trust is a, who is uh, controlling the trust. Covered under related party, sir. So no, if there is a control of the same person, then it is a related party. If trust is an independent, then there is no related yeah, party. Yeah, then there will not be any yes, yes. relationship. Under, it has to be seen in the context of accounting standard because under Companies Act, it won't be falling under the related party like definition. Ma like many under big the accounting standard, doing, you have to check. Yeah, like many big companies doing CSR activities through their own trust. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Then, because that trust is incorporated by either the promoter. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, sir. Okay, okay yeah, next. Then, then it is a related again. party. Na? One minute. I would like to say here again, Trust, as far as the company's section 2, subsection 76 is concerned, it is not falling under the definition of related party. But as far as the listed company is concerned, it may fall under the definition of related party because their accounting standards are also covered apart from section 2, subsection 76, number one. Number two, if it is not a listed company, according to me, trust is not a related party. Accounting standards are only for the purpose of disclosures, not for the purpose of compliance. Okay, okay. Next, whether convertible portion of debenture should also be taken into consideration while determining threshold limit? Ankit? Sir, for which threshold limit? Convertible uh, portion of debenture. Maybe materiality, they are asking. No, no it mean, has to be seen in the context of the amount of the transaction, that is the amount of debentures. No, actually, it will be double so, counting. Sir, no? 20 threshold. Ankit, you, Amit, you are saying something? No, I was saying that the question is whether the shareholding would be, the convertible portion of debenture would be considered for the purpose of checking whether he falls in the related party list or not. The 
twenty percent diluted basis. Yeah. So it will not be. It will not. Uh, yeah. I agree with Anjali. It will not be. No, it will not be at the beginning or the end or at the. Sir, but the question is, uh, if you have issued convertible, convertible debentures, whether the shareholding of ten percent or twenty percent has to be checked on fully diluted basis? No, it has to be checked on as on basis. So convertible instruments will not be covered at that point of time. Because it will be a double counting. No, sir. How can we double counting if my I have a convertible no, instrument? The initial limits also covers that, na? Okay. Next. Uh, what changes are required in related party transaction policy amit can you suggest some points <laughs> yes uh, there are many points uh, there are couple of structural points because your definition of related parties itself has undergone a change so one thing is that secondly the law now, now requires you to specify <clears throat> as to what will be considered as a material modification so you have to determine the criteria on the basis of which material modification shall be recognized because now the material modification shall also be subjected to the approval of audit committee or the shareholders as the case may be yeah so uh, these are some of the changes which are mandatorily required uh, to be taken in your related party transaction policy uh, starting from april 1 2022 Okay. Uh, next question is: What is uh, uh, what are, does material modification mean? Ankit, sir, material modification has to be first defined by the audit committee as to what they mean the material modification. It can be modification which the audit committee feels material in any related party transaction. It can be the quantum of the uh, contract value, uh, parties to the contract. tenure of the contract or uh, uh, inbuilt values of the goods and services for which the contract is there so it has to be defined uh, on these parameters by the audit committee uh, in the policy okay uh, uh, sudhakar can some guidance be given on what parameter can be used to define material modification so well, certainly say that according to me it may be uh, uh, what's called as pricing it may be quantity it may be quality it may be any kind of deliverables which is going to have an impact on the contract what you have entered into that is amounts to material modification okay so, uh, i mean these are all the, the parameters any any parameter if is having a insignificant uh, modification in the different thing eh? but it is having okay. a material impact it is to be taken. that's why it has just left to the audit committee to decide the parameters uh, of uh, this particular i mean this material modification they have to determine that and they have to recommend to the board and as a matter of the policy it has to come so just to add what sudhakar sir was mentioning it is uh, highly debatable as to what will be considered as material it is not easy to understand and to my understanding uh so far what we have studied and uh, the policies what we have created we are not able to have the absolute parameters where we are having a clarity that uh, if you increase the value of transaction by 10% or 20% it will be considered material there will always be the element of amit what for the next there seems some internet issue okay now now next question is uh, next question can someone guide uh, me given by what parameter should be used to define material modification i think this uh, i think this is done uh, covered next, yeah next how to distinguish modification as required under section 177 4 Uh, visa is material modification. So that can you can. Then it qualifies material. You have done the dual approach where you have. Okay, welcome, Madan sir. Uh, your uh, uh, your topic is going on. So anybody can guide. May I, may I give my view on this? Yes. Yeah. On materiality view, what I guide or I advise to my or give my legal opinion also on this to my clients. first of all from the materiality point of view to go through the law whatever law provides that is material there is no doubt about that secondly it should be left to the audit committee or to the board of the company to define and prescribe what is materiality 
third i always say whenever there is any doubt that whether a particular transaction is material or not whether a modification is material or not whenever there is a doubt consider it as material and go ahead and do the compliances so that tomorrow you are not subject to any show cause notice or any prosecution notice any Is other so only Balance one is. just a small point what i just wanted to add uh, because as i am able to understand what madan sir is saying the materiality what is defined in law so are we saying 231 proviso that provides for the materiality a uh, theft materiality parameter so are we saying anything which is crossing the threshold of 10% would be considered material my my answer is perhaps no because that we have to distinguish 23 one is limited to the shareholder approval purpose and not limit not for the purpose of considering the material modification amit but i think amit if if law has left to the discretion of the audit committee let us rely on their wisdom uh, they are taking decision considering the context of the matter and the um, yes, everything of cannot business. be modified no, okay, okay. Why because, say because, uh, Amir, because if everybody if every time we start judging on someone's wisdom then these terms as we all know are very difficult to have a standard meaning across unless and until then you put it as a part of the law which the law makers also don't want to that's why they have left it to the wisdom and if we are uh, Challenging the wisdom of the audit committee or the independent directors every time, then then what's the purpose of putting them onto these? So I'll give you the example. I think that will give a clarity. Let's say we have done a contract for hundred crore purchase of raw material, and raw material price was rupees hundred per piece. Now I have not changed the contract value. Total contract value remains hundred crore, but I have reduced the quantity. Yeah. And now price has increased from hundred rupees to two hundred rupees. Okay. Whether it is whether it is amounting to a modification, material modification or not, because it it may it may because it will reduce the quantity. So I think all these hey, parameters have to be considered by the committee while they define the material modification. And we have been defining all these parameters in most of the policies so that uh, and left it to the discretion of the audit committee also in in case of specific transactions. But it, this is how we can only uh, create some parameters as to define it. And I think Sudhakar sir wants to add something. He is waiting. And as far as the material modification is concerned, as I have mentioned, it may affect quantity, quality, deliverables, everything. Plus, apart from that thing, it also depends on the size of the organization also. True. See, for some companies, it may be even for, for, suppose enough to bet ten percent is the material modification. For a, some other company, even point one percent might be a significant difference. Mm. Exactly. That is my as point. Ankit, as Ankit has rightly said, that that is the only thing the regulator in his wisdom has left it to the company, and we must appreciate that. Just like ordinary course of business in one eighty eight, earlier people used to say, "Why can't the ministry define that?" I used to say from the rooftop that point of time, "Why the moment they define ordinary course of business?" You have to work within the four walls. You will have the problem. Same is the case here also. What is material modification? They left it to the companies, rightly so. So audit committee has to put their wisdom together. And when they are going to the policy, the policy should be as wisely as they have to draft it so that time and again they should not amend it. Out. So okay, now threshold yardstick cannot be taken. Okay, okay. Uh, I think uh, enough discussion on this. Uh, next question is. on the same issue whether audit committee approval of listed entity is required only in case of material modification as companies act require approval for all modification ankit sir we have... are um, taking a view that for audit committee transactions all kind of modifications are required uh, and for shareholders approval or board if it goes to the board we can look into in terms of material modification okay any different practices somebody is following okay no. next Okay, next, because uh, friends, we have it. Uh, we have, I think, hundred questions. I have only completed twenty-five, so I have to be fast. So until less, you have some other thing or some. Uh, uh, then you can uh, stop me. Otherwise, I'm just uh, uh, rushing now. And this What is done. You can move on, sir. Ah, uh, okay. This is also done. Next. Uh, 
रेगुलेशन ट्वेंटी थ्री टू ऑल रिलेटेड पार्टी ट्रांजेक्शन एंड सब्सिक्वेंट मेटीरियल मॉडिफिकेशन सेल रिक्वायर प्रायर अप्रूवल ऑफ ऑडिट कमेटी ऑफ दिस्टेड एंटिटी हवर ट्वेंटी थ्री टू बी एंड सी प्रोवाइड थ्रेश होल्ड लिमिट इज इट नॉट दिस इज ए कॉन्ट्राडिक्शन सुधाकर no contradiction at all what they say 232b and c are concerned and that is the threshold limits where you require the audit committee approval once you got the audit committee approval and wherever you got the shareholders approval you have taken that subsequent to that if there is a material modification to that again you have to go back to the audit committee and maybe to the shareholders if it is so required so there is no okay. contradiction at all okay madan sir the new reporting disclosure format provides where a transaction is undertaken between members of the consolidated entity between the listed entity and the subsidiary or between subsidiaries it may be reported once please clarify what does this mean i think madan sir is not there sir i think what does it mean is that since both are related party transaction that both like so it need not to be reported twice if the transaction is reported once it is in compliance okay any other view yeah, that's correct a is a holding company b is the subsidiary and a is purchasing a material from b so only one leg of the transaction is required to be reported that's what the law says shivam change the questions i think this you are showing the Um, now next question. Next, question. next, is there any specific reason why the half yearly disclosure of RPT or to the exchange are changed from consolidated basis to standalone? I think Sudhakar, standalone is not there. Uh, Sudhakar, I think because of the amendments what they have brought in, they have roped in the. subsidiary companies also as the under the related party approvals and all so they want rather than on a consolidated basis they want on a standalone basis to get more data according so it okay. will be easier for them to scrutinize or examine the operation i think okay. answer is clear i have to have a both more and more disclosure and transparency correct okay madan sir uh, in absence i have asked one question whether next question whether the loan disclosure is required in format for loan given or both loans given and taken as as we discuss single transaction will work if it's between same related the one and another related party company and a subsidiary so it can be disclosed on from one end madan sir must have some different view i know no i no, no different opinion ankit ko okay, to waise bhi ankit ko waise bhi kabhi oppose nahi karta main ओके, ओके, तो नेक्स्ट टाइम ही विल अपीयर मेरा इस पे छोटा सा क्वेश्चन है मैंने एक लोन का ट्रांजेक्शन किया है मैंने एक सौ करोड़ रुपए का लोन लिया मैंने एंट्री साउथ इंडियन फ्रेंड्स आर हियर ओके आई हैव टेकन अ लोन फ्रॉम द रिलेटेड पार्टी फॉर रुपीज हंड्रेड करोड़ नाउ आई हैव शोन इट एज अ रिलेटेड पार्टी नाउ वेन आई विल बी मेकिंग अ रीपेमेंट ऑफ दिस लोन from the related parties to the company whether this transaction again required to be disclosed so that can you have any view oh, according to me no okay but i think sir this is disclosed under the uh, uh, as24 disclosures that forms part of the financial statement amit sir yes it is coming there because so, so the balances now question is why i am asking because uh, 23 9 disclosure if you appreciate there how will be placing it uh, i'm just thinking of a bit if okay. both the transactions at different point of time in one financial year we would have disclosed the borrowing and in another the repayment so it will be coming are you saying so? i think if if, if it's uh, as per if, if it is shown in the accounting standard disclosure because the it has to be framed in accordance with the same disclosures that you are giving under as 24 or as 18 whatever the case may be so the similar transaction will also come in that disclosure 186 register for the loans and investment at point of time only when i make the investment i will make the entry when i dispose of the investment i will not make the entry same is the case with the loan also when i take the loan i will make the entry not for the repayment but sir so under 186 
Under Anna? sir, under variety six also, but when we repay, we just mention in the remarks they don't repay. Yeah. See, loan doesn't the, mandate the, us the to do so. The logic for that is the moment you have taken a loan, you have to repay it anyway. That is important. I think yeah, it's that. but obvious. Okay, now next question is there are next question. There are different requirement under Companies Act in LODR. For example, RPT between government companies are exempted from LODR. But under the Companies Act, approval of the board is required. Can be harmonized provision of Companies Act and SEBI LODR pertaining to RPT? The harmonization is always required, but SEBI always view that listed companies are to be measured with a different scale than of the unlisted companies. That's why they always say that to some extent harmonious, uh, they were they brought in already. If you see the listing regulations when they introduced with the company set, there was a lot of disparity was there. But to a large extent, they have brought the harmonious thing. But as uh, in fact, in one of the forums, I asked them also the same question. I have been given the answer by SEBI official that look, listed companies we want to handle with a different, I mean, they have to be measured with on a different pedestal altogether. Uh, okay. May I? I will not, neither I will call it disharmony nor I will call it inconsistency. I think we discussed this issue at the time of framing the standards also that if two or more legislations are applicable to a particular provision, then what, which, whichever is the stricter one will apply. There is no question of inconsistency between the two. The I think that the apply, user wants to harmonize. He wants both, both laws should provide the same thing. No, that, that, that's not no, possible no. To, to, to a particular organization. To, if three regulators or four regulators are, are regulating the, that particular entity, certainly there has to be inconsistency. And, and let's not call it inconsistency. Certainly, okay. a particular uh, regulator uh, wants to run a particular unit in a particular manner. Let, 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 let's that, respect that. That the that truck the truck says. If there are two, three contradictory things, that a strict rule will follow. That is the normal That's point the which somebody should follow. Okay. Now I will ask questions which public has recently just now asked. Does Madansa judge non-material relation related party transaction of subsidiary company require prior approval of audit committee or listed holding company? Yeah, question. Amit, just ask. I am a broader, broader one. Not particular compliance or particular. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Please repeat, I, I just uh, missed out. Does the non-material related party transaction of subsidiary company require prior approval of audit committee of listed holding company? The threshold is 10%. If your transaction where LISCO is not a party, transaction is between subsidiary and the other related party. Then if it crosses the threshold of 10%, you require the approval of audit committee, not otherwise. Okay. 10% of the consolidated turnover or 1,000 crores, whichever is lower. And of the consolidated financial statement of the whole four. Sir, here 1,000 crore limit is not, it's not there. It's not there. No, it is not there. Sir, but I mean, sir, if, if, if we, for any, any transaction, which if triggers the approval of audit committee, a, this FY for a subsidiary, then it will only be a material related party transaction. It has to then also go to the shareholders because the limit is 10% of the consolidated turnover, yeah, which is otherwise the case for material related party transaction also. I think uh, there I have a little different view and I am of the view that there is a, a concept of transaction with related party and related party transaction, which I have stated, I think, in the last program also in this forum itself. And my view is that uh, where the listco is not a party, the shareholder approval is not required and that is by design SEBI has done so. And that's why the definition of related party to one ZB has not been amended to one ZC related relating to related party transaction has been amended. But in case of related party transaction, they have not used it. If it is a transaction by the listed entity, it says any related party transaction or a series of transaction which exceeds 10% or 1000 crore and a All transaction right. by so, a subsidiary, a transaction by a subsidiary with a related party is a related party transaction as per the LODR regulations. So if okay. materiality, sir, I mean, in material related party transactions, they have only used the word related party transaction and related yeah. party transaction yeah. includes a transaction by the subsidiary only with a related party of the listed entity. So Ankit, point is that I just want to draw the attention on two para. 
you go on the proviso 2231 where the material related party transaction has been defined now there they have used a different word now when you come to uh 234 they have used a different word so now question is unless they harmonize the transaction with related party and the related party transactions to mean the same thing i think we cannot interpret that uh, both uh, are same and the shareholder approval should not trigger Manda, but then is... then it will not defeat the entire objective because you are saying if you if you enters into 10% with a related party cannot... you require approval but your subsidiary enters it then you don't require approval no, 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 I I tell, it, I tell. it will create imbalance i'm not wrong i mean if i am not wrong what you say is that there is the related party transaction the whole volco is not a related party but only the subsidiary is a related party then shareholder approval is not required correct and correct that is what you say where the volco is a related party that point of time material related party transaction it has to go to the shareholder now let me, let me let me sir just give me a minute i'll explain this point the way i have understood because if we read the definition of 21zc it covers now four type of transactions where listco with a related party of listco listco with related party of subsidiary subsidiary with related party of listco subsidiary with related party of subsidiary now 234 in the search only the transaction with related party it does not in the search a transaction a uh, related party transaction so these four transactions are out of ambit of 234 the way i read it then you correlate it with 231 because those transactions are out of purview and i am saying by design seri has done because their intention was to subject these transactions to audit committee approval only not to the shareholders approval because I think uh, maybe I am uh, wrong, but I tend to agree with you, Amit. In fact, that's why I am asking the question. What I told you, I yes. tend to agree with you. Where the whole co is a related party and the material related party transactions are there, you have to go to the shareholders. If the subsidiary is a related party and not the whole co, that point of time it has to go only to the audit committee and not to the shareholder. Absolutely. This is what okay, I, I tend to agree with you. May okay, I? friends. Uh, no, 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 no. 15 seconds only. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> From a practitioner point of view, today we are here to clear the doubts and not to create the doubts. And yes, if the yes. consensus, is, if the consensus is not emerging, then my view is, if a particular transaction is a related party transaction or not, if there is doubt, treat it as a related party transaction. If there is doubt whether the transaction is material or not, treat it as material. If there is doubt that is immaterial transaction, a transaction which is not material should be taken to AC or not. Take it to AC if the transaction already happened. Take it to AC for ratification. If you have AC, so what is the issue making? What the point? So the heaven is not going to fall if you make it part of the agenda item. Even though you have already entered, it, take it to AC and ratify it. No notice shall be issued. You will not be subject to any any penal action. So I think Madan sir has given the Brahmastra in the hands of everybody that wherever there is a confusion, treat it as a related party. Okay, uh, Madan sir, I have a question. With the effect from April twenty three, uh, related party transaction of subsidiary exceeding ten percent of its annual standalone turnover would require to prior approval of audit committee of the holding company. in case the subsidy is having nil or say turnover of 1000 then in this case a transaction of every 100 rupees by the subsidy with its own related party would require a prior approval of audit committee of the holding company is it not illogical I think is illogical i think sebi has already provided a clarification all the, on all this and the intention of the legislation is not to comply with those things or those, those provisions where nothing has been provided if you think there is no need no transaction value is 100 rupees i don't think law is mandating all that that's not the intention of the legislation let's not try to read between the lines with a very having very very strict interpretation of the provisions which are not practically possible to be implemented let's okay. take a pragmatic and practical view 
Sudhakar, what is the effect of new Karo Tunti on the RPT in reporting as it's a word relate, uh, related is omitted and it says any party? Sudhakar, what is the effect of new Karo Tunti, uh, Tunti on RPT in the reporting as the word related is omitted and it is say any party? Yeah, yeah, see, that is the fact, you know, that uh, in fact, recently we have discussed that question also is that it is going to put a lot of burden on the auditors. Because when they say any party means it is virtually, uh, what in which context they have brought that, I don't know. In fact, uh, day before yesterday, instead of chartered accountants have brought a guidance note on CARO 2020. I am have to go through that, maybe if they have given some kind of a guidance there. Okay. Whether during the year the company has made investment in, provided any guarantee or security or guaranteed any loan or advance in the nature of loan secured and secured company uh, to companies, firm, limited liability or any other parties, will it treat as a related party? Yes. Uh, I mean, these kind of questions are... Okay, uh, Ankit, is company A has right to appoint majority director on board of the company B there by agreement? We can read it and answer it, otherwise it is very difficult. Okay, okay. Uh, Ankit, if company A has right to appoint majority director on board B by agreement, will company B become subsidiary under section 287 of Companies Act? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Madan sir, if a promoter of the listed company is providing personal guarantee to the loan taken by the subsidiary of the listed company, whether it could be a RPT. Yes. Okay. Sir, you have so, to unmute. Can you repeat the question, please? Promoter of the company is providing personal guarantee. Yes. Yeah. To whom? Company. To a subsidiary of the company. So will it be treated as a related party transaction or not? My answer is no. Any other different view? Because this is a personal guarantee to be provided. First it's a transaction between subsidiary and the related party of the holding company. The first test is you have to see whether for that subsidiary, this promoter is a related party or not. Now, this, this, this promoter of this company is a related party or not. To me, answer is yes. The person would be a related party. If I am doing a transaction between subsidiary and its related party, then why it will not be a related party transaction? According to me, providing a personal guarantee by the director of the company in his personal capacity to the subsidiary company will not be treated as a transaction, also will not be treated as a related party transaction. Also. One leg of transaction. Madan, who is providing the guarantee is a related to the holding company. Let it be, let it be, but he is providing a personal guarantee. According to me, this is my personal view. This is, cannot be called a related party transaction at all. Sudhakar, you have a different view? Do Madan sir ka baat It is a related party transaction. Pardon? It is a related party transaction. I agree with Amit. Huh? Okay, Setya ji, your experience? He is a related. I'm not saying he's not related. I'm not saying he's not related. But he's this is not related to the related party transaction for the purposes of Companies Act or LODR. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When promoter and prom promoter group are, con we consider them as a related no, party no, transaction. We, we, we have right to we have right to differ, sir. Thank you. We have right to differ. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, so so majority views that this is a related party. Madan, uh, you are absolutely right on some aspect, but the question is somebody is giving this. So transaction is related party or not? But Madan, what Madan is saying is also right. When there is no harm, related party is connected to this way also that you are taking some advantage. But here you are giving something to somebody. Yes. So not, now, now, now let not me, every related party transaction is about advantage. Let me add yeah. one more dimension. Uh, point for pondering, it may be like uh, there may be a guarantee commission or there may not be a guarantee commission. That's a separate issue now. Now the, the, now the question is, <laughs> you, you, now that's separate so, issue. So, guarantee so commission is being given, yes, it's a related party transaction. 
But if there is no, no guarantee, guarantee commission is a reimbursement, yeah, basically. So the only thing okay. we have to see, in fact, that as per the listing regulation, the related party transaction definition is very wide. That's why you know there we have to see transfer of obligation, availing of services with or without any kind of uh, consideration. In that light, if you examine it, it will fall under the related party transaction. But anyway, as a GP, you are rightly said that we are agree to disagree. Oh, so okay, okay, okay. Whether payment of dividend to shareholder is related party in the context of promoter? Already exempted, sir. So, so, so uh, it is exempted now. Earlier also, we are taking a view, it is not a related party transaction. Now it has been clarified that certain corporate actions are not related party transactions. Okay. How will the disclosure of interest given by the director where he does not know what is the investment of his relative? As writing nil would not be correct regarding holding of related party. Ankit, any? Nitesh, Ankit, any? There is no other way than to collect the information what is required to determine these all maturity thresholds. Maybe the MVP1 form is not alone sufficient, but you have to capture this data to determine all these thresholds. Okay. So friends, uh, I have completed related party questions which we have received earlier and which we have received just now. But some question which will come, I will ask the last. With your permission, with your permission, can I make a submission to both corporate yeah. professionals as well as to the participants? As you might be knowing, in the recently in the all the WhatsApp groups where I am there, I have posted about this thing that SSB at SSB we are coming with a revised guidance note on lead party transaction, which we had done when you were the chairman SSB. Now we are revising it because of these amendments which have come. If any contentious issues are there or ticklish issues are there, I request everyone to send it to me because I am the convener of this subgroup of this RPT. Okay. We will okay. bombard you, sir. We will uh, discuss, we will... deliberate, and the SSB and we'll address the issue. And, and Sudhakar, that. today's all points we'll give it to you also, so you can deliberate these points because these are the issues which is coming. Okay. okay. Now, okay. Friends, while 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 giving this statement, can Sudhakar be treated as a related party? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he is doing something good, not for his own benefit. Exactly. That's what I said. The benefit. Somebody <laughs> giving no guarantee. That's for good. Okay. So friends, now I'm moving to the CSR, uh, the encoding form two, and the Amit uh, Gupta, Ankit Singhi, and um, uh, Sudhakar, they are, and anybody can add. So now, uh, friends, we have been only half an hour and so many questions. So no further discussion, yes and no answer, I will start, okay? Uh, no long discussion. Because all these professional who are asking these questions, they know the things, only they have a confusion, so they want clarification from you expert. So now... No discussion, only answer. Uh, Amit, I'm starting with you. We are a section eight CPSC companies and our activities are the incubator funding. Very well covered under schedule seven. It is requested to confirm if we can raise a CSR fund and deploy in our own activities as apparently there is an exclusive exclusion under FAQ by MCA that company cannot deploy funds for its own activity, but silent on the role of company as an implementing agency for CSR. Your view. Yes, uh, very well. If you are acting as an implementing agency for, for two purposes, if I believe correctly, this is a Section 8 company registered by the government of India for certain incubation services. And for that purpose, if they are raising the funds, they can do so in that manner also. And secondly, if they are uh, taking the funds as an implementing agency and deploying it for that purpose, they can do that also. I don't see that there is any. Okay, uh, I mean, next is it is required to maintain a separate bank account for these CSR fund raised for just separate accounting is required? Yes, obviously, to maintain the transparency, whatever business uh, you are doing uh, by way of raising the funds, if you are deploying it for that purpose, you should have that separate account and whatever you are doing as an implementing agency that you should do. Although law does not mandate, but uh, it would be always a good accounting practice to have two separate accounts. Okay, Pro, uh, so subsequent question, provision on carry forward or unspent amount by implementing agency of CSR fund raise from other company. 
so as far as uh, whatever money you have raised from the other like you whatever money you have received as a implementing agency as we have clarified time and again that implementing agency is not under the obligation to transfer it to unspent csr account obligation is on the company that is doing the csr if that company has failed or implementing agency has failed the money should go back to the company and company will open a unspent csr account and transfer it to the fund transfer it to the okay. bank account okay next question Uh, Ankit, for which financial year details relating to turnover, net worth, and net profit shall be filled in form SCSR two? I think it should be for the year thirty uh, first March twenty, because we are filing the form for twenty twenty one. Just to add one more point, uh, because uh, Rule three two says if uh, I have became qualified for doing the. C I mean, your voice, or his voice is cracking. I mean, your voice is. What I'm trying to say that under Rule Three, if provision of CSR is applicable for one year, then it has to be applicable for next three years, unless and until I am out of the provisions for all three years. Only then I am relieved. So in that case, if for that. immediate preceding financial year i might not be fulfilling the criteria but on account of this rule i am getting the applicability on me so then there is an issue which year amount needs to be full, uh, provided okay okay so uh, that in Ankit, that case you have to fill the data for the year <clears throat> amit your voice is breaking please check your Amit, your voice is breaking, so please check your internet, and then we will ask question from you. Okay, Sudhakar, in the form CSR two, I am filing uh, detail of turnover, net worth, and net profit as on thirty first three two thousand twenty, as mentioned in the form POC four. But in pre scrutiny, it is mentioned that detail does not match with SRN number POC four. How it could can be done? I think Amit, Amit, uh, you can give us. Actually, that particular issue has been resolved now. And the form is being accepted now. I think the scrutiny error is not done. This is what I have been told, but I don't have expertise as far as the form filing is concerned. Ankit, do you have any view? Sir, I am aware of this fact that this issue is there, uh, and the details are not matching. And more importantly, in case of net profit, because actually net profit has to be calculated as per Section 198, but in the AOC four, we are providing a different uh, uh, amount. But I think Amit ha has looked into this issue. Amit, uh, what's the solution in this case? So what uh, we have experienced was now, sir. If I am audible now, yes, you are. Some audible. with some disturbance. Okay. So Amit, what, you can log in. You can log out and log in again. Ankit, one CSR. Uh, next question: Whether a company filing under Section One Thirty Five criteria. Uh, but having no csr obligation by virtue of average net profit mandatory to require file csr 2 yes okay next a uh, one csr 2 file can be revised i don't think so uh, uh, so dakar i think the system sir the system is not allowing to yeah. revise the form actually okay next how to name the csr project in csr 2 i choose to type the description that i choose While selecting from the pop-up menu, item-wise for each row, but MCA system throws the error message that I should type the name of the project. It also wipes out the because automatically login out of the screen. Can I guide it on this issue? Sir, reach out to help desk. Okay. Next, if company makes CSR voluntarily and not filing form under section one thirty-five criteria, then such company need to file form CSR two. No. no. Okay. Okay, Amit, uh, just uh, uh, no. Uh, when I am doing voluntarily, and let us say you have a uh, some carry forward, then in that case you will be required to file CSR two. Otherwise, this next year carry forward issues may. Come. Okay, okay. Next is rule three two of one CSR provision are applicable in any financial is applicable for three years in our C uh, company CSR was applicable. 
in 2018-19, but it was not applicable in 1920 and 2021. Request you to please guide whether filing form CSR2 is compulsory for such company. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Next. Next. Uh, is company uh, does not file CSR2, uh, then what will be the consequences? Uh, Sudhakar. Non-compliance. Huh? Non-compliance. That's it. Okay. It could be a non-compliance of 450. Where the information is sold by government. Yes. Okay. If a company trans next, if a company transfer fund to its own trust created for CSR and the administrative expenses of trust are below 5%. However, the trust is managing the project through implementation agency. Hence, the administrative expense of the implementing agency are admissible as CSR expense or not. I mean, Amit, I think no, your system. Amit, you have to log out and then log in. No, I think he has logged out and re log in. Um, Amit ji, I think I have picture. Band karke. Now, okay. Now, now is it better? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. So I am saying there are two issues which we have to understand. First issue is that administrative expenses cap is only for company. It is not for implementing agency. That is point number one. When I have given the funds to my own trust, which is an implementing agency, then it is out of radar of 5% cap. Okay. Then okay. Next. my fourth question automatically gets answered. Okay. Next. Company has some, uh, Sudhakar, company has some spare building. This building was renovated to be used for CSR activities. The said renovation expense were capitalized in book and is appearing balance sheet as capital asset for CSR. How this renovation expenses can be transferred? You know, when the asset is not a CSR asset, they should not have capitalized this. They have done a wrong capitalization. So maybe they declare that asset is as a CSR asset and transfer it. Okay. Because they have done a wrong capitalization. Okay. Uh, next, CSR is applicable to company, but the company does not have 2% average net profit. Does what to fill in whatever, whether the company has spent amount towards CSR? Yes or no, because system is not taking zero figure. Now what we will do? Ankit, Amit, anybody? So this is an issue that we have also encountered and we have discussed with Ankit also. So the solution is that you perhaps don't have an option to fill the uh, figure zero. Uh, you have to live with that. You have to attach a clarification unless ministry comes out with some suitable modification. Okay. Some question which public has so asked. Have to, have to... Okay. Ankit, we have a private company whose NP was 8 crore and financial it 1920. From financial 2021, the company does not fall within the within any of the criteria mentioned in section 135. Now, my query is whether company need to contribute to CSR in financial 2021, considering the rule 3.2 of CSR rules. 14 yes. Is still... Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, the next question is, uh, which is uh, which public has just now asked. Uh, this is relating to CSR query. Amit, you can give during 2021. Company has built 50 crore hospital, built 50 crore hospital under CSR activity. Board has approved donation of hospital along with land and to eligible trust as per one section 135. But convincing deed and gift execution could not be done before 31st March 2020. Can we say CSR is completed for uh, financial 2021? Can we count the same for CSR expenses 21-22? Yes See, and no. If I, if I understand correctly, the expenditure has already been done. The conveyancing or the title deed transfer has not taken place in the name of the only the part. Amit, you have become robotic. Amit, uh, Ankit, you can give answer. I think that if expenditure has taken place, it will be counted as CSR expenditure. Okay. Okay. So friends, now I'm moving to the LLP. Uh, I have so many questions. So please bear with me. 
uh, I will uh, this uh, um, Amit this Amit Gupta is giving answer. Amit, you have to be very very yes and no. If Amit is not able to understand, Ankit Nitesh, you can give answer. Which type of LLP will be known as small LLP? I think this uh, question uh, I, you you have Ankit, you can give. I am not following Nitesh. Are you following LLP? Amit, you are able to. Uh, Amit, I, I think the small LP is uh, the same as we follow the small company. Uh, small LP is same as good as small company. The threshold limit the same. Okay, amendment to additional filing fees of LLP form is applicable for previous year pending form also. <laughs> Amit, yes, are you there? Yes. Yeah, please tell. Amendment to additional fee filing fees. Sir, it is applicable. Okay, next. If a person is designated partner in 10 LLP and director in 15 companies, can be uh, can it will be default under section 165 of companies are coming, Ankit? And sir, so under no. section 165, there is no limit in terms of designated partners. That is in the LLP. I don't think there will be any default. Um, more LLP partners will not uh, invoke uh, the non-compliance under companies. Act. It will be a non-compliance under LLP Act, not companies. Act. Okay, next. So, uh, is section 90 relating to SBO applicable on LLP? Does LLP need to file initial declaration from uh, Ben 2? If yes, then what is the timeline? Ankit Nitesh, anybody? Timeline. I think it has to be 30 days, uh, the normal timeline that is there. I actually am not following LLP. I'll okay, no problem. Uh, Amit, is yeah, yeah. Amit is there. Amit is there. Amit. If I'm audible now? Yeah, yeah you are. So, <clears throat> as far as I understand, these rules are yet to be uh, released by the LLP. Notification, the provisions will become applicable. So, as a good practice, we should take the declaration in a Ben 1 format and we can keep it. And as soon as the LLP forms are released, we will file it. Okay, Ankit, uh, Amit, uh, when the uh, LLP new portal will start? Because already uh, migrated to LLP version 3. Now, only issue that has uh, been faced by all across the people that uh, they, there are some teething issues with regard to the filing of the form and portal is not stable. I believe ministry is working on the same and it should be sorted out uh, in a short span of time. Okay. Amit, uh, next, next question. Uh, I think next question, this is very, this too long. Next. Next question. Shivam. Amit, clause CD of subsection 1 of section 167 applicable to LLP, which told about contravention of provision of section 184. And the other hand, section 184 is not applicable to LLP. How it can be applicable regarding on vacation of office by a designated partner in LLP? It will not be applicable, but uh, the provisions of Amit, I think uh, I think your to that. Amit, your your voice is breaking. Voice uh, just is cracking. System. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's still cracking. So now I am coming to the insider trading question. Okay, Mohini is there, and I hope uh, Narayan Shankar will also join uh, because his meeting was going on. So Mohini, are you ready? Uh, yes, sir. Mohini, very quick because I have uh, more question on takeover also. That is so many amendments has taken place. So you have to give answer in a very short. What are the opportunity available for appeal against order of adjudicating of order of SEBI as low category employee of the company who has no knowledge of the company financial information 
traded in FNO, which includes the company he is working. What are the options so if he is a uh, if he has but no knowledge is not a the ignorance of law is not the uh, not a way out so i think uh, the company uh, the, you can uh, go for an appeal but definitely based upon that you have no knowledge and you have traded in the fndo and you are the designated person so then you are you are being liable to pay whatever the penalty is. But he said low category employee and junior employee. No category employee will not be a designated person. Generally, generally he will not be. But if he has he has gathered any information and so if the, it proved that he is an insider in that case, then another kind of case can be. So Moni, simple sir. If we talk vanilla, then he is not responsible. But if he is connected to anything or he has any information, then he's that he's. Uh, treated as uh, uh, the insider. Right. If he next. has gathered any information. Yes. Yeah. Next. What is the opportunity available? Uh, yeah, no. Next question. Whether trading in equity share is only prohibited while a person is possessing UPSI or it includes all form of securities? No, any form of securities. Nowadays, debt, come, debt is also listed. So in case if your debt is listed uh, and you are, sharing, you are trading when you are you're trading in the same script of uh, listed uh, tech securities and you are in possession of UPSI, you are liable as per the law. But that security, what will be the change will take place? Sir, uh, nothing. You can, the securities are covered. So it's a listed security. If your debt okay, is listed, it's a listed security. Okay, next question. Whether structured digital databases to be maintained by intermediaries or and fiduciary? Yes, PIT uh, insider trading is applicable on intermediaries and fiduciaries as well. So SGD need to be maintained by them as well. Okay. Do we need to disseminate the UPSI list which we have prepared as a measure to our internal control of the to, to the stock action also? No, no, you are not supposed to. Okay. Do we require a maintain structured database even when UPSI is shared within the company? Yes. The sharing of UPSI within or outside, in both the cases, you need to have and you need to make an entry in the structured digital database. Okay. Whether transfer of share from one DMAT account to another DMAT account of the same person will fall under the ambit of some trading? No. No. If you're, no. No. It will not. So, but if uh, but gift and other thing will be treated. Gift is a trade. So if you're gifting to your uh, uh, any kid or child of yours or any brother, sister of yours, it is a trade. Okay, next. Whether requirement of pre-clearance is applicable for exercise or employee stock option? Mm, no. Pre-clearance is not required because exercise of ESOPs have been excluded as a trade. Okay, next. Does pre-clearance required in case of off-market transaction of securities? Yes, whether it's a non-market yes. or off-market, pre-clearance is required. Pre-clearance is required okay. on the trade. So it doesn't matter it's off-market or on-market. Okay, next. Whether transaction for which pre-clearance was approved can be executed when trading window is closed? No. When you no. have, uh, no, uh, no pre-clearance is given only up to the time when the trading window is open. If you have obtained okay. any pre-clearance and your trading window get closed during that period for the execution time period, then your execution time period will be get reduced till the trading window is open. Okay. Can grant of ESOP be made in trading window closer period? Yes. Grant of ESOP yes. can be made. Okay. Next, does contra trade restricts apply on individual share transaction or it applies on transaction executed on particular date? No, transaction wise we need to, not the shares. Uh, it doesn't matter with the shares. That means if you have... Uh, uh, purchase today, then you cannot sell, enter into a sale transaction. And similarly, you cannot enter into a purchase transaction. It doesn't matter with that how many shares are being involved in all these transactions. Okay. 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 Next, uh, now uh, the questions relating to uh, uh, insider trading is over. I am coming to the takeover code. Manoj and Ruchika and other person can also give answer, but uh, I have to just quickly, and there are some 10, 15 questions uh, which are connected to all topics. 
So let me just finish take over code and then I'll come to the other questions. Okay, so I will start with uh, Manoj. We want to transfer the share held by the promoter of the listed entity to the person acting in concert. The said transfer is not covered under exemption provided in regulation 10 of the secure SCB. Uh, in case, uh, in this regard, we have the following queries. How to transfer the share? Price at which transfer shares to be transferred? Up to what extent percentage of total share of listed company shares can be transferred? What are the reporting requirement? Manoj. Yes, sir. So, good evening, everyone. So, it is a... If the exemption is not available under Regulation 10, then we have to see the th uh, limits. So if it is uh, the collective holding of the per person and the person acting in concert is more than 25%, they can acquire 5%. So transfer can be up to 5% of the paid up capital. Uh, in case it is uh, less than 25% collectively, then it will be uh, the threshold limit will be 25%. And the, uh, here there is no pricing requirement. Alternative is we can go for exemption if if they can claim certain um, logic and justification, then they can seek exemption from SEBI under Regulation 11. So that is the only rule. And reporting okay. requirement will be as per as per the uh, applicable Regulation 29.1 or 29.2 because it is it will be off market transactions, so SDD will not be applicable, and manual disclosure requirement would be there. Okay, Ruchka, what are the system-driven disclosure and when SDD come into force for takeover disclosure? Good evening, everyone. So, SDD is a system which was introduced by SEBI in December 2015, through which they have uh, instructed depositories to disseminate the data of shareholding of promoter and promoter group, as well as the public category shareholders who are holding shares in DMAT mode by linking the PAN with the DMAT account. And this process uh, generally automized all the manual filing, which we do in PIT or takeover regulations. And for uh, last year, they introduced it for insider trading. And from 1st April, it is effective for takeover regulations as well. Sir, you're on mute. Next question. Yes. Yeah. When disclosure under Regulation 29 is required in case of convertible security, either upon acquisition of such security or upon conversion of such security into equity shares, Ruchka. Sir, in both the cases, the disclosure is required because under Chapter 5 of TECO regulations, uh, the shares shall include convertible security as well. So in case of convertible debt instrument or convertible preference shares, uh, the or any security which is convertible into equity share, the disclosure would be required at the time of acquisition of those convertible security as well and at the time of conversion into equity shares as well. But there is one interesting point. In case of warrant, there would be no requirement of filing disclosure because warrant is not a security as per the definition of convertible security. Okay. Manoj, with effect from 1st April 22, Regulation 30 is omitted. Whether promoter are required to disclose their aggregate shareholding and voting right as of the third, 31st day of March 30, 2022? No, it is not required. It is automatically dis reflected as per, well. and that is also very clear from the FAQ of SEBI. Okay, next. Ruchka, whether del this declaration under regulation 314 is still to be given stock action and audit committee after uh, introduction of SDD mechanism? Yes, sir, because it is in addition to the pledge disclosure under 31, which is automized under SDD. So this is still required and NSC also issued a circular clarifying it that how we have to file it. So yes, it is required. Okay, next. If the, uh, Ruchka, if the holding of any shareholder remains the same, but the percentage of shareholding or voting right of the total paid up share capital of the target company change due to some corporate action like buyback preferential allotment, whether the shareholder is required to make disclosure to the changes in stock or shareholding disclosure under Regulation 29.2? No, sir. For These are passive increase in percentage voting rights. So there is no disclosure required. For only active acquisition disclosures are required. SEBI has issued FAQ over it also. Okay, next. Uh, <clears throat> are sh schedule uh, a commercial bank and public sh financial institutions exempt from disclosure requirement under Regulation 29? with regard to acquisition share by them on invocation of pledge, Ruchka? No, sir, no. They are exempt from open offer, but disclosure they, has to give, they have to give under regulation. Okay, program. next. Ruchka, even after SDT came into force, whether any disclosure would be required in the following case, if A and B are pre-PSC and each other and A acquires, say, 3% and B also acquires 3%, then cumulative the shareholding will be 6%. Whether the situation requires manual disclosure under 29.1, 
Yes, sir. Because uh, see, in the SDD mode, uh, the shareholding of A would only be shown as uh, you know triggering the disclosure when it will uh, individually acquire five percent. So when when we are talking about PSEs, the disclosure has to, is still in manual mode and has to be filed by the persons uh, triggering that threshold. Okay, will you will your answer be same if the A B are not uh, uh, A B are not PSE and B is required? Eight no, percent of the shares. Then, then probably there would be no requirement to file manual disclosure. Okay, next, Manoj, whether invocation of pledge uh, exceeding the threshold limit triggers the requirement to make open offer. Uh, invocation of pledge is uh, exempt on uh, for certain class of persons who generally uh, do this these type of transaction in ordinary course of course of business. So uh, all scheduled commercial banks are exempt. All public financial institutions are exempt if they are acquiring those shares. Under normal course of business, but all other persons, it will be triggered open offer if the threshold is breached. Okay, Manoj, how within how many days allotment of shares can shall be made if open offer is triggered through preferential allotment? Uh, the ICDR regulation specifically provides that in case of uh, in case of preferential allotment, uh, offer is triggered, then offer uh, the allotment has to be within fifteen days from the. Uh, last day of competitive offer that is 15 days from the uh, date of detailed public statement under the takeover regulations so if the offer is uh, if there is no competitive offer then this will be the timeline if the, there is also a competitive offer then the allotment will happen only after the completion of the offer offer process it is to protect the interest of the competitive bidder basically okay ruchka can open offer be acquiring shares once made be withdrawn in general, no. Only in specific cases, when uh, let us let us assume if acquirer is an individual person and he passes away during the course of open offer, then or if any statutory approval was there required for the open offer, and if that is not uh, received, then it can be withdrawn. And in uh, in case when uh, they, when the offer is conditional and uh, the condition is not met. And in one case, when SEBI is of the opinion that offer should be withdrawn. So these are only the four conditions given under Regulation 23 of takeover. Okay. Ruchka, if uh, Mr. A holds uh, uh, this, whether there is a trigger of open offer, if A has received shares from B pursuant to transmission, succession, or inheritance? No, sir. There is a specific exemption in this regard. Okay. Manoj, if Mr. B holds 24%, uh, 24%, B hold 15%, C hold 3%, are they are member of the promoter and promoter group? If A further acquired 2% of the shares of the target company, whether there is a trigger of open offer? Uh, yeah. So as per regulation 3.3, uh, that threshold limit of 25 need to be checked for individually as well as collectively. So here, uh, Mr. A is holding 24% and if he acquires 2%, he breaches the 25% limit. So collectively, whether uh, their holding is not going by more than 2% and they collectively they are more than 25%, but individually A is less than 25% and going beyond 25%. So there will be trigger of open offer. So you have to check both the things cumulatively. Individually as well as co collectively, yeah. Okay, people do, do always do these mistakes. Okay, Ruchka, if the payment is delayed beyond 10 working days of the closure of the tendering period, will the acquirer be required to compensate the public shareholder who are participating under the proffer? Yes, sir. In case uh, the delay is attributable to acquirer and because of them, if the delay is, then they have to compensate by paying 10% additional interest. But let us assume if the delay is not attributable due to some you know, statutory authority took some time and they were proactive in taking that uh, statutory approval. So then there would be no compensation required. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So next question. If a person was not holding any shares on the identified date, but the acquirer acquired shares subsequently, then whether such person is eligible to participate in open offer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because uh, identified date is only for the purpose of sending the letter of offer. And they can tender in open offer even if they acquired after the identified date. Okay. Uh, if uh, whether next whether physical no, whether physical shares can be tendered upon uh, under open offer or not if yes then what is the procedure 
till now sebi has uh, not you know disallowed the tendering of physical shares and delisting of a buyback and takeover so yes it, they can be tendered and the process is that uh, that physical uh-huh. shareholder has to open a trading account with the dps and through that trading account the bid has to be made and the physical certificates and all the you know documents which are required for tendering shall be sent to the rta's address within two working days so that is how their shares can be accepted under open offer Yeah, not okay. DP, but broker. We have to Brokers. approach yeah. some brokers. Yeah, I was, I meant brokers yeah. only. Okay, what are the precondition to claim exemption amongst promoter and promoter group companies? Under regulation ten, sir, uh, if uh, promoter and promoter group members want to seek exemption, then they have to be shown as promoter in the shareholding pattern for last three years. That is the first condition. They have to comply with Chapter Five compliances in last three years. If they are not complying, then they are not eligible to seek exemption. And other condition is that the acquisition price for the interstate transfer shall not be more than twenty five percent of the price determined. If frequently traded, then volume weighted average price of sixty trading days. Okay, Manoj, uh, can it family trust whose members already form part of the promoter and promoter group of the target company seek exemption under Section under Regulation Ten for the acquiring shares of the target company for very first time so family trust and trusts are not uh, recognized as one of the category of person who are uh, under who are basically under automatic exemption in the regulation 10 except except uh, regulation 10132 uh, a2 a2 which talks about any two persons who are collect, uh, being shown as promoter for last 3 years so if they are not being shown as promoter promoter group part of the promoter promoter group for last 3 years then a trust cannot acquire under interstate from any other member of the family but oh. but many of the cases the exemptions are being granted and sebi has uh, given a specific uh, checklist for exemption in such cases where shares need to be transferred to uh, trust by the uh, settler who is part of the promoter promoter group so subject to certain conditions the exemption is granted and we have uh, provided such type of many of the cases exemptions are given so that is okay it. okay now now few questions which have which just now have received can uh, uh, which can private company this this is op, uh, open for all this one uh, can private company issue unsecured unlisted convertible debenture manoj you can tell private company uh, there is a restriction uh, it should not be covered under the definition of deposit if it is not falling under def- definition of deposit yes then it can Okay, Nitesh. In the form MBP one, do we need to disclose about directorship in other companies? As Section one eighty four two does not have the reference of directorship in other companies. One eighty four two. No, for disclosure is required under one eighty four one, not one eighty four two. MBP one goes under one eighty four one, where you have to disclose all your interests directly, indirectly. It includes directorships. Okay. Uh, Setia ji, will the whole purpose of appointing ID will not defeated if the promoter appoints some one known to them? Any penal action against the company or ID is if later it is found. The known to them is not. A, uh, he can be independent director. There is no doubt. He can be independent director, provided he should not act accordingly. According Madan, to the vision Madan, of the promoter. Madan, you have any view on this? i think is part discussion i think we had we had a detailed discussion on this point earlier also that it is a matter of uh, pers- one's personal way of uh, acting if he is acting in, in under influence of the promoter then he should not be that is the yeah. criteria okay okay a company uh, comp- if company a has right to appoint majority director on board i think this answer i have we have given uh, yes. Okay, uh, Mano, Mano, the company has got in principle approval for migration from SME platform to BSC to main board of BSC with effect from seventh January two thousand twenty two, and also get trading approval with effect from thirteen January two thousand twenty two. The qu- quarterly compliance for the quarter ended on December twenty two are also required to be complied by our company, which are especially applicable on main board listed company like quarterly financial result, shareholding pattern, and corporate governance report. Ankit, you can tell. Yes, stock so, exchanges generally ask you to submit all those compliances. Okay, uh, uh, Madan sir, I just read in IICA E uh, ID database website the CA or CS is practicing more than ten years exempted from. I think this. 
Are this answer is this. this? Yeah, yeah. That question. So director yeah. say he does not know. New. I think this is incomplete. While reporting violation of designated person under insider trading code, Moini, who has the decide who who has to decide the action against DP uh, because violation need to be intimated promptly. Uh, so first the as soon as the violation uh, get noticed, so the compliance officer duty is that uh, whatever the internal control processes set by the audit committee for them for the uh, this penalizing these uh, kinds of violation, uh, compliance officer can take immediate action and can report to this organization. And later okay. on, audit committee can take the final. Okay, Ankit. Uh, Nineteen twenty, the company does not have the profit of five crore. But the company has spent CSR based on previous applicability, and while filing the form CSR two, it automatically popul uh, populated the report for in spend. But the company has spent all the amount in financial year twenty twenty one. So what? So she is asking, is right or wrong? I think she has done right so far as I understand. Any different views, Dakar uh, and uh, Nitesh? So I think the, uh, they have uh, done it rightly. Okay, section eighty nine is applicable only to individual. It is not applicable to trust. Section Rakar, section eighty nine is applicable only to individual. It is not applicable to trust. This is the question. Has to five. Definitely, the trust cannot hold the shares in its own name. It has to hold in the name of the karta. I'm sorry, that the trustees. So it has to file the MDT four five six. Okay, where the change in second order of DMAT account is required from file from C filing. Manoj or Rachika, anybody from where the changes in second folder of DMAT account is required to file. Form C. I think this is Form C of insider trading. Moini, ma'am, any view on this? Yes. Uh, changing from single to joint, na? Yes. And joint yeah. to single. That yes, definitely Form C. Because PAN number on the DMAT account linked will get changed. Okay. So I think uh, I have tried to complete all the questions uh, which we have received around eight, uh, around 20, 30, 34, 35 questions here, or. 80 questions we have received yesterday. So we have tried to give answer. Friends, uh, 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 thank you all uh, because this is the uh, uh, model we have changed that now onwards, uh, whatever new amendments will come in the month, we will cover up next month, first Friday. So if anybody wants to give any suggestions how we can improvise this, please write to us. And all your questions, you can give it to us. We have tried to solve or we have to give, give the reply. But if anything is not clear, please write to us. We will reply to you. So uh, one minute, I'll give all the people. Please suggest us how we should structure. So I'll start with late comer Madan sir. Madan sir, can you suggest how we should do? Uh, so it will be more effective, more useful for the public. I really like the way that you have done it today. It should always be in Q and A form because in Q and A form you cover so many legislations and so many issues which you have able to cover. And I must compliment your zeal and enthusiasm that wherever you are, whether in India, US, or UK, you have not broken the tradition while being in Dublin. Also, my hats off to you. I had I been there, I, I would have thought twice whether I am going to have this webinar or not. But hats off to you and to your zeal and your commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sudhakar? I echo whatever GP has mentioned it. And the uh, only thing is that when you are mentioning that whatever the amendments have come, we will take up on the first week of uh, first trade of next month. Not necessarily you have to make it as a yardstick, but if any burning issues are there, you can definitely consider organizing a special program for that particular thing. Say, for example, related party transactions, CSR, significant beneficial ownership rules. These are all certain burning issues, and people have still no clarity enough. So, as and when that kind of things are coming, you can consider having an exclusive webinar on those issues. And then mm -hmm. I will also take this opportunity to thank you once again for giving me this opportunity especially with all your M4 colleagues 
I got immensely benefited today. Ruchika, uh, Manoj, Mohini, and Ankit. Uh, Ankit, of course, always uh, I used to be there along with him. In fact, thanks to each one of you also. Yeah, Ruchika has made an um, uh, appearance today. Mm -hmm. uh, she is yes. uh, uh, okay. Uh, Saitya ji, one, one more suggestion that in addition to the latest amendments. If you can cover the latest judicial pronouncements also, which will be really be helpful for the professionals. Yeah, we, Madan sir, we will structure it in such a manner that whatever queries are there, whatever confusion are there, we will write this and try to solve the confusion that what is the, but you have given a very good guidance to everybody. Something is not clear, follow the principle, which is a sticker. That is a good principle. Setya ji, your suggestion on this, First of all, congratulations to you and, and the boy and the family. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think Madan sahab add, added good thing that the, we should give legal pronoun pronouncement on the amendment, if okay. any available. Okay. Otherwise, so we'll it this. is not. We, yeah. first, Amit first Gupta. Is good. Okay. Amit. Amit voice is uh, robotic. So, Ankit, uh, I will start with you. I think first of all, we should thank Sudhakar sir, Madan sir, Satya sir and everybody else who are always available to join our webinars and spare their precious time. I know it's April and uh, difficult for them to take out time. And I think we have, we, we uh, objective of this format is to have to give some clearance, uh, clarity to the audience also that every week on the first month, we will be having this session and uh, we will be having Q&A because queries is something which we all tell on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's, so, it's, so it's a, it's a is, good beginning. Is, I hope we'll be able to uh, live it up. This is, the idea of Ankit. this is the idea of Ankit, which he has given last time. So I will request all the participants, don't wait for the webinar. You just send the queries. We will collect it. Uh, so every month, uh, whenever the law is coming, you write to us. We will collect, collate it and do it. And friends, we are not only doing this, we are sending to government also. That these are the issues. Manoj, you have any view? Yeah, I think it is very important. Uh, queries are always in the minds of professionals who deal with the things day to day. So if there is a platform where they can discuss, and obviously we, we are able to gather some best of the minds uh, from the industry. So that those, um, those things would obviously add value to each of the professionals. So I think we should continue with this format. Uh, just, just to add, I think we also discuss, sir, we'll have, we'll bring some new formats also this year of uh, yeah, we are, sharing knowledge. Yeah. So, so Sudhakar and uh, Madan sir and Setya sir, all people, we are working out that how we can improve because now our hundredth webinar is approaching in July. We will have a grand uh, uh, gala program on this, but before that, we want to create this, that every week you will identify your issues and we will do it. Moini, you have to add any point? Uh, sir, uh, all, the, all the points have been covered. Only my suggestion uh, in this is that uh, based upon the time period uh, wherein the few compliances uh, are based, like in the coming month, AGM is coming or annual report filings and are there. If we can uh, pick up those topics during those particular time, it will help uh, the professionals to uh, get their answers, whatever their queries they have at that time. Okay, Nitesh. I think Nitesh uh, is not there. Rushika? Sir, I think oh, most of the, oh, yes, sir. One minute before it goes out of my mind, I thought, no, let me see. I'm sorry for that. Oh, so, like a real once in a while, if not yeah. every time, once in a while, bring some good management expert. Good management expert to give a lecture on the management related topics also, you know, which will be beneficial for all of us. And once in a while, you may consider that also. Sorry, okay. please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Ruchika. Very good suggestion, sir. I liked it. Although all the points have been covered, and I really like the suggestion of Madan, sir. So I think we should uh, always focus on QA and it should be in a time bound manner. That is more important, which I think we, we are overshoot by 14 minutes today. But yes, I think we yeah, are. Yeah, Madan, sir, last word. Actually, when Ankit was uh, sharing his vote of thanks to me and Sudhakar and Sethi, sir, I think there's no vote of thanks required because we ourselves are also beneficiaries of these webinars. 
Yeah. When we discuss these questions, we have to have out of box thinking and what can be the practical answer to a particular query. We, we, are, we are also bene true beneficiaries of these webinars. And secondly, Pamanjip, now you, uh, I'm really liking the way you are doing. I'm offering my services to discuss and share at least for 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe if you ask each webinar in each webinar, latest judicial pronouncement under Companies Act, IBC and competition law. Okay, so Madan sir, next uh, webinar, uh, the judicial pronouncement work is uh, in your head. So you can share the questions, uh, the, the case uh, law in advance. Yes, so we no, 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 not the question, not the question, but what has been decided? What was the issue under the windows? Yeah, yeah. And what, what has been decided? Yeah, that's right. So you can share the case law that these are the case law you will cover because mm -hmm. this has come. So we will we will tell public that these are the cases which are important has come. So thank you very much, all my friends, learned friends, and uh, the dignities and this special thanks to all participants. Uh, despite of overshooting, they are still there. Thank you very much to all, and uh, I hope that our journey will continue, which we all are committed because now we have a eight and ten departments. So every department is assigned to one topic so every every two months uh, they will get one topic like takeover listing company law you know, uh, the mna insider trading so they will do so thank you very much to all of you. thanks uh, friends for joining us uh, thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone and 15th uh, we will meet everybody again uh, next friday if it is not holiday, I think uh, the Good Friday is there on uh, 15th. Yes. Yes. Uh, otherwise, we'll meet it uh, on the next next Friday, uh, the same time, four o'clock as per Indian time, till 